Uh, what's going on, guys? I'm Nick from Talk Interference Sports, broadcasted on the Game Changer Sports Network. This is your need-to-know video on the XFL before the season kicks off. It was almost two years ago, on January 25th, 2018, that Alpha Entertainment came out and let everyone know that they would be reviving the XFL and that it would be a 10-week-long inaugural season in February of 2020. Vince McMahon and Oliver Luck have teamed up to make sure that this XFL launch will be a viable and competitive league. The league came out with eight teams that were placed in major media markets around the country. These teams are the St. Louis Battlehawks, the Tampa Bay Vipers, the Houston Roughnecks, the New York Guardians, the Seattle Dragons, the Dallas Renegades, the Los Angeles Wildcats, and the DC Defenders. The XFL decided to go with five of the seven biggest media markets in the United States. All eight XFL markets have at least 2.9 million residents each. I love this because it shows that they really want to stick around for a while and seems to me that it's going to be more promising than previous spring leagues. Leagues that have picked low market cities with no NFL presence have not performed to expectations such as the AAF. It seems well thought out even picking St. Louis as a city. With the Rams just recently leaving for L.A., it's a great way for the XFL to give those hungry football fans in St. Louis something that they once had and will possibly fill that void. The XFL has been a league before. Its first and only season was financially backed by NBC's executive Dick Ebersol and Vince McMahon WWE chairman and CEO who is currently still involved with the XFL. My assumption is that NBC had recently lost its NFL broadcasting rights to CBS and this was an attempt for Ebersol to try and still have football on the network as well as competing with the NFL. The 2001 season had implemented many rule changes from what most were accustomed to. Their attempt to use sexual content with cheerleaders, attempts to promote violence, lack of talent, and gimmicky presentation was very unconventional and was probably ultimately their downfall. They even surprisingly got twice as many ratings as initially projected to their advertisers in their first few games, but this, unfortunately, would not last. The failing season ended up costing Ebersol and McMahon around $35 million each, though it's not surprising with the amount of advanced technology and video coverage that the league had implemented. It was very ahead of its time, so much ahead of its time that the NFL ended up adapting many of its techniques in their media coverage. Things that are regular in football coverage such as miking up a player, the sky camera, or interviewing players in-game were all groundbreaking innovations that the XFL brought to modern football coverage. During a documentary made by ESPN in 2017 called This Was the XFL, Vince McMahon had stated he had intentions of trying to revive the league. Most people were uninterested in the idea of another football league. Though this second time around already has signs of success, their willingness to make corrections of the first season follies with gimmicks such as sexualizing cheerleaders is already apparent. They have altogether gotten rid of cheerleading in the league. In 2001, when XFL had its first run, football was not under a microscope with CTE, concussion research, and general player safety and wellness. Well, it's 2020 now, and these things are definitely a concern for everybody. Some of the player conduct policies that differ from the NFL, including discouraging XFL players to make political gestures during games and players who commit a felony are immediately disqualified from participation are things that I believe are a great overall look for the league. And with most of these players looking to reach the NFL as a long-term goal or have their careers revitalized, I don't think that there's going to be many incidents like you see in the NFL. McMahon said that they would be evaluating their players based off of many things, including the quality of human being they are, and that people don't want social and political issues coming into play when they're trying to entertain fans. Something to mention that seems to be possibly groundbreaking for football as a whole, 
that the XFL has incorporated to their leagues and policy is the omission of all marijuana and cannabis testing. Players are not even tested if they're playing in a city in a state that has not decriminalized it. Very well thought out in my opinion by the XFL, with the amount of NFL players coming out and expressing their thoughts and feelings on how beneficial they believe that cannabis and marijuana treatment is. Here are some of the on-field rules that the XFL has come out with, and you can expect in the upcoming season that is different from conventional football around the United States. Here is passing behind the line of scrimmage. This is the XFL double forward pass. This is about offensive creativity. Typically in football, only one forward pass is allowed. So if you want to try one of those tricky double passes, that first pass has to be a lateral, and those are risky. Not in the XFL. In our game, two forward passes are allowed as long as the ball doesn't cross the line of scrimmage until that second pass. So the game speeds up and the playbook opens wide up, creating exciting and unique opportunities for dual threat players. This is for the love of football. This is the XFL. Commissioner Oliver Luck has said that this will also speed up the tempo of the game, which seems to be a major focal point of this league. He explains that this will eliminate unnecessary penalties and will allow a referee to focus more on where the line of scrimmage is instead of whether or not a ball was passed laterally or not. This seems to be a major marketing point for the XFL. They're trying to make their officiating more efficient in terms of stoppage of play. Though the tempo and speeding up the process of the game seems to be really important to the XFL, they don't seem to want to trade player safety for this. Here is the kickoff. This is the XFL kickoff. This is about creating more opportunities for big plays. To eliminate high-speed collisions, we're shortening the distance between opposing players. The coverage team starts on the opponent's 35-yard line, and the return team starts on their own 30. When the ball is first kicked, only the kicker and receiver can move. But once it's caught or is on the ground for three seconds, all players are free to run, block, and tackle. We're giving players and coaches the chance to create kickoff excitement. This is for the love of football. This is the XFL. This is the XFL punt. This is about coaches thinking twice about punting or going for it on fourth down. In the XFL, if a punt goes into the end zone, the receiving team gets the ball on their 35. And forget about coffin corner kicks. Punts that travel out of bounds are placed at the 35-2 or where the ball left the field. Whichever is better for the receiving team. Plus, the punting team can't cross the line of scrimmage until the ball is kicked. So the receiving team is less likely to call for a fair catch and more likely to return it. We're making the punt more about coaches going for it on fourth down. So get ready to get loud because a crazy return or fourth down conversion could be coming up. This is for the love of football. This is the XFL. The XFL has even gone and changed up the extra point after scoring a touchdown. I think we can all agree that the extra point is the most boring part of the NFL. They've even tried to make it more exciting by moving the point in which teams are kicking from further back. But unless something wild happens, it's usually the same old, same old, unless a team gets unlucky and misses a kick, and it's not very exciting most of the time. I love what the XFL has done with the extra point. Here's a video. Check it out. This is the XFL point after touchdown. This is about raising the stakes and stepping up the strategy. In the XFL, the scoring team has three different point after touchdown options, and none of them involve a kicker. The first option is an offensive play from the two-yard line worth one point. The second 
is a play from the five yard line worth two points. And the third is an aggressive play from the 10 that earns three points. The scoring team's offense only gets one chance to convert whatever option they choose. And if they fail to convert, they get nothing. And the defense can score too. If they get a turnover and return it to the opposite end zone, they get the same amount of points the offense was attempting. That's three, baby, that's three. So now there are more chances for teams to come back and no lead is ever really safe. This is for the love of football. This is the XFL. This is the XFL overtime. This is about edge of your seat, game ending action. There's no coin toss, no one possession wins, and no ties. Instead, XFL overtime is a shootout. So the best players on both sides always determine who wins the game. Each offense gets up to five one play possessions to score from the five yard line. Teams get two points for each successful conversion. Teams alternate plays until one team is mathematically eliminated. The defense can't score, but if they make a stop or create a turnover, the play is dead. The team with the most points after the five round shootout wins. If it's tied after five rounds, then things go to single rounds until one team scores and the other doesn't. Because this is winner take all kind of football. This is for the love of football. This is the XFL. Outside of the kickoff, speeding up the game is very important and it shows in these implemented rules such as game clock and play clock. Outside the final two minutes of each half of the game, the clock continuously runs, stopping only for a change of possession. When the game reaches the final two minutes of each half, the clock will stop after all plays from the line of scrimmage. This is an attempt to mitigate the efforts that the game clock management takes on teams that are trying to make a comeback. Normally, during a two-minute drill, the game is drastically slowed down with all of the timeouts and spike balls, and this becomes rather tedious. The play clock is 25 seconds. This is the shortest play clock of any league in the United States. The play clock in the NFL and college football uses 40 seconds on their play clock, where the 2001 season of the XFL used a 35-second play clock. The XFL has also showed interest in placing one-way radios in offensive players' helmets so that they can all hear the play instead of using a long, drawn-out huddle. The XFL is set to kick off on February 8, 2020, where the Seattle Dragons will face off against the D.C. Defenders. The XFL has three broadcasting partners during the first season. You can find them on ABC, Fox, and ESPN. All right, everyone. Well, I'm really excited for this season, and I really hope you are, too. I'll be covering the league as much as I can on my show, Talk Interference Sports. We have our live show on Game Changer Sports Network, and you can always find it on YouTube. I'm all over social media, and will be sharing as much as I can on this league. I have an Instagram, a Twitter, a Facebook. You can pretty much find me anywhere. I'm all over. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel, like it, Drop a comment and share it wherever you have social media. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate you watching this video. Take it easy. If you smell what the XFL is cooking.